this first edition of ICS Conversations. We have a wonderful panel. I'd like to invite them on stage. That's Shushan Prabhupada. So thank you very much for uh, turning up. This is quite a sizable audience uh, for the I first ICS Conversations. This is the first edition and the Institute of Chinese Studies is hoping to continue with this tradition. They're hoping this could uh, eventually become a tradition at least uh, one ICS conversation every three months. <coughs> ICS has been at the forefront of uh, many interactions on Sino-Indian issues, now of course the Sino-US issues. Uh, last month they launched the ICS lecture series with uh, Ambassador Sham Saran being the first speaker in the, in the lecture series. Uh, before that I believe uh, there was the Think Tank Forum, a very successful uh, edition of the Think Tank Forum that was uh, launched last year, ICS was an only agency for that. And later this year, I believe, uh, towards the end of the year, they're going to be having the Exploring China, Society, Culture, and Connections series uh, at the end of the year. And early next year, in January, uh, they will have another two-day exhibition on uh, the people of Chinese origin in India. So they're doing a lot of great work on uh, China, India, as well as, of course, uh, China's relations with uh, major powers around the world. So my thanks first of all to ICS for organizing something like this, the ICS Conversations, and we hope that this will be the start of a great tradition. Of course, of course, this is uh, in collaboration with the India International Center, so I want to thank the, uh, the honorable members of India, India International Center for uh, giving us the logistics, the space, and of course, uh, many of you are ISC members, so thanks for turning up for the first edition of uh, ICS Conversation. Incidentally, uh, I think 20th August, a couple of days back, was the founding day of uh, ICS. So uh, here we are, just a couple of days after the founding day of ICS. So uh, let me introduce my uh, panelists, our lead speaker, uh, Ambassador Shivshankar Menon, former National Security Advisor, former Foreign Secretary. Uh, he's been ambassador before uh, in a long and illustrious diplomatic career. Uh, over almost 40 years, advisor in China, High Commissioner in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. To his right, Professor Alka Acharya, currently Professor at the Center for East Asian Studies at the School of International Studies at JNU. Uh, she was formerly director of uh, ICS and also the former editor of the journal, uh, The China Report. To Ambassador Menon's uh, left, Dr. Navroski Dabash is Senior Fellow at the Center for Policy Research. He's also the coordinator for the Initiative on Climate, Energy, and Environment at CPR. And to his left, Dr. Zarawar Dalat Singh, a fellow at the Center for Policy Research and also a junk fellow at the ICS. So our topic uh, for the first edition of ICS Conversations, and by consensus, uh, we're keeping it very broad. It's on uh, US-China relations and its impact on the region and also on India. So, the way we've split up this, uh, the format for the first edition is our speakers, led by the lead speaker, Ambassador Menon, will have opening comments, brief opening comments, about five to seven minutes. Uh, then we'll have a brief uh, sort of free-flowing discussion for about 10 to 15 minutes. And a majority of the time is going to be devoted for audience questions, about 45 minutes or so for audience questions. So I'll uh, just set it up for you four broad themes that we uh, hope to touch upon in uh, today's conversation. Uh, first, of course, when we talk about US-China, because of the topicality, uh, the, the situation that's unfolding on the Korean Peninsula, the uh, missile issue that is developing with North Korea, and what kind of impact it may have on the region. The second broad issue on South China Sea and China's sort of uh, sometimes unilateral moves that we've seen over the last few years and what impact it may possibly have on the region. Uh, we'll also touch upon uh, climate and energy in the context of uh, the United States now announcing that it's pulling out of the Paris Accord. Uh, how may that impact uh, the developing world? And finally, in terms of what uh, broad impact this could have, the emerging US-China dynamic on uh, our region, the South Asian region, 
And um, just earlier this morning, we had comments from President Trump about his AFPAC policy. These are, these are the four broad areas that we thought we'll uh, touch upon. Uh, so may I first invite uh, Ambassador Minut for his opening comments uh, on US-China and what, what kind of impact uh, do you see the changing US-China dynamic on the region? Thank you, Zeta. Thank you very much for the very generous introduction and the setting the tone. Uh, it's nice to see so many friends here this, this evening. Uh, we, we actually thought we'd speak about, look at China-US relations because, frankly, it's a critical relationship in both senses of the world. Uh, it's critical to the world economy, to the Asia-Pacific, to our immediate periphery, to us. In, in many ways. But it's also critical in the other sense. It's, it seems to be, well, maybe it's not in the ICU right now, but it's, it seems to be at least at, a, at an inflection point. Because if you look at China-US relations over the last uh, decade and a half or so, it's now characterized, and how it's evolved, it's now characterized by a level of codependence economically, which is really unprecedented. And you have to go all the way back to, to England and Germany before the first, first World War, maybe, if you look for a parallel. At the same time, they have a level of strategic competition going on among themselves, which, is, which has grown over the last decade or so, uh, which, is, which is getting more and more intense. And it's being fed by a whole series of factors. One is the fact that there's been a power shift. There's no question. If you look at it from 2000 onwards, economically today, uh, it's hard to tell which is a bigger economy, the Chinese or the American. It depends on how you choose to measure. And the world is economically at least multipolar. It is no longer the kind of eco world economy that we were used to. Militarily, it's still prime. The U.S. is dominant, still dominates, and still has the kind of power that no other power, not China, not anybody else, and even, not even in a, uh, a combination of powers can hope to match easily. Politically, it's in the balance between these two, if you look at the, the situation around us. So, you have had a power shift which has led to actually creating huge unpredictability in the China-US relationship. And this is fed by what's happening in both countries. In the US, Trump, I think everybody, you don't need to explain why Trump is a factor of unpredictability in the relationship. He came into power with a certain agenda on China, which included being tough on China on trade, tariffs, very high tariffs on Chinese goods, currency manipulator, etc., South China Sea, etc., etc., all of which seem to get dropped by the board if China were willing to cooperate on North Korea. Uh, now he's saying China is not doing her bit on North Korea. He started an investigation on China's IPR practices. Let's see where this goes. But basically, the unpredictability factor from the US side, but equally on the Chinese side, because if you look at China's behavior, since 2008 at least, uh, China has been much more assertive in pursuing what she regards as her rights. Whether in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, we have an instance of it in Doklam, where she's doing things today which she hasn't done for years, which she had actually stopped doing some years ago. And we see also, and I think we tend to underestimate it, a Chinese attempt at order building which in terms of the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, in terms of new institutions like the AIIB, the Asian Investment and Infrastructure and Investment Bank, and a whole set of attempts to try and create a new order around herself. And both the Chinese and the Americans are telling the rest of us, choose between us. The Chinese tell you that their rise is inevitable, that the last 150 years of Western dominance, US dominance, were a historical aberration. We're now returning to the historical norm of a dominant China and a China-centric world. Frankly, as Shamsan explained, that's not no inevitable 
responsibility, and there's no reason to believe that narrative, but that's the narrative there. So they say, choose us, we're the winning side, we're the future. The Americans say, do you really want to be, you are all beneficiaries of the so-called liberal world order that we have run for you since the Second World War. Don't you want to continue to gain those benefits? We are the net provider of security. We look at all the benefits you gain, and it's true. Both India and China are probably the two greatest beneficiaries of that open, liberal world trading order, which really, and globalization, which really lasted until the 2008 crisis. So, but frankly, if the US and China can run a relationship which includes huge economic codependency while at the same time managing strategic competition. Why can't the rest of us? Do we have to choose? For me, this is really the question. There are two questions that really face us on China-US relations. Can they manage to do both things simultaneously? They have so far, by the way, for several years. They've managed both the competition and the codependence. And it's hard to see either one of those winning out. Today, if you look at the US, for big US corporations like Apple, China represents 24% of her profits. Even if you look at old-time chemical companies, DuPont, 9% of her profits is from China. I don't see how the US, where business counts, is going to either turn that off for the sake of strategic competition, but nor do I see the US ceding what her dominant position easily or giving up on the strategic competition for the economic. So the question is, can they manage this? That's one big question. The other question is, how do, how do the rest of us manage in a world where both these things are happening at the same time? Are we, are we clever enough to actually deal with both? I'm not sure, because for us, the effects of what we see is each one coming to us and saying, choose, pick a side. Uh, you see examples of this from the US, you see it from the Chinese. When Trump says that India makes a lot of money out of trade with the US and needs to do more in Afghanistan, that's a linkage, that's a sort of transactional linkage that we're not used to facing because we're today facing a US which has a completely different attitude to dealing with the world. It's no longer there to run a world order, it's no longer there to man manage a balance, it's there, out there, transactional, America first. But the Chinese are equally China first in the way they look at it. And they also, when they say, come and where do you stand on BRF? When they say that to you, they are in effect asking you again to choose sides, to choose a China-centered world order. Then. Within that, therefore, it's going to be increasingly difficult, I think, for other countries, unless they manage their relationship with each of these, and unless you can actually build a meaningful relationship which, which matters with both at the same time, neither of them will be honest with you. And so it's essential that you actually, to my mind, that you actually strengthen your strategic autonomy and work on it. Within that, then, you can look at which bits of the new order which they are creating between themselves, willingly, how it works. Look at climate change. You look at the new trade and investment order. You look at the fragmentation of the world economy. Now the TPP is gone, the RCEP is the only game in town in the Asia Pacific. You look at each part of that, and frankly, you end up doing running a very selfish policy. You pick and choose which bits work for you and do those. But you have to be prepared both for Sino-US collusion and for Sino-US competition in each of these areas. And that's a much more complicated terrain to navigate than either the bipolar world or the Cold War, where you knew how you could predict what they would do or even the unipolar world before 2008, where again, you could predict the behavior. Today, you can't predict the behavior, and that's my basic point. But therefore, it's very important that we look at how we deal with each of these relationships separately and don't get caught up in the narratives that we are being sold by both of them. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think you've very, very,
comprehensive manner as much as is possible in, in seven minutes. Uh, brought out the various strands in the US-China relationship and what it could possibly mean, some of the consequences of it for us and how do we uh, benefit from both. Uh, there is strategic competition, yes, there's also convergence in many areas. Uh, if I can draw from there and go to Zarawar and talk about the strategic competition that uh, we keep talking about between the US and China. And one sort of theater where we've seen that play out uh, quite dramatically is the South China Sea. I'm just curious, how, how does India sort of fit into this? Uh, like as you said, uh, we have to play the smart game without having to choose uh, between uh, either side. And yet at the same time, how long can you hold out for? So if you could sort of draw the strand from, from where it has to let go. So I, I'm, I'm going to actually ex try and extend uh, where Ambassador Merrin was going. And, and I'm going to argue that despite all the noise and rhetoric that we've seen from the United States and China, they actually have still a deep vested interest and habits of engagement that they're going to continue. So we are facing a part transition, we know that. Now, what kind of historical parallels should we look for? Is it going to be like the British accommodation of the United States in the 19th century? No. Is it going to be like the British-German collision, where you had interdependence, but a frontal collision and eventually demise? Unlikely. Is it going to be like the US-Soviet rivalry, a cold one, or the hot one that we see in the last five years? No. So. You're seeing this pattern play out, and I, what I found very interesting, both for my own archival work that I've done, is the United States, even at the most, I mean, if you think today is complicated and heightened, back to the 1950s, there has been a, uh, a, a sense that China was lost. We had opened this up in the 19th century, we had this trading relationship, and Eurasia must not be consolidated and united. So I see this trying to think, it's got, even as far as Eisenhower and Dulles, they allow the British fairly uh, robust relationship with the Maoist regime, even though you had pressure on the eastern flank that I'm talking of this united bloc. The door was always left open for the Chinese. I, I, I have this fascinating uh, uh, NSC memorandum, March 1966. This is at the peak of the Vietnam War. And I just want to quote from you, this is an advocacy for a new China strategy. Uh, one highest priority task for American policymakers in the year ahead is to help domesticate the Chinese Communist Revolution in its relationship with other nations, or to put it another way, to help reclaim the Chinese mainland to responsible membership in the world community. The argument of Chinese intransigence or non-responsiveness is only marginally relevant to this strategy of flexible initiatives, but rather be looking at a long-term uh, uh, favorable Chinese response on a number of objectives. So they waited patiently, and uh, when the opening comes with the Sino-Soviet split, 69, 70. So you look at uh, recent commentaries that are coming out in the United States, I've been following it pretty closely on how uh, they are away from the administration rhetoric. You're seeing the same discourse that the door must be left open to China. We get, we need to bring China into the mainstream international community. So there's also on top of this triangular dynamic, which is very powerful, and I think we should underestimate it, that they will not allow Eurasia in their worldview to become united. And we would like that opening to come on a US-Russia detente for the United States establishment and consensus. China is where the opening must remain, despite everything we've seen. There's also something very, very interesting. John Palfrey uh, written a fascinating work, which I strongly recommend, where he sort of traces this relationship for the last 200 years. He said there's, there's also a sense of cultural benevolence in US images of China, where despite disappointment and exhilaration in these cycles of engagement, disengagement, uh, that this is a great power relationship that the United States can manage and, and develop, and it's going to be different from the European great power relationship. So I think that's something which we now, 
you've seen sort of Graham Allison's Thucydides trap thesis and etc. I look at it differently. I see the United States, the more sort of historically oriented uh, scholars are actually calling attention to the power transition and advocating that it must be avoided, uh, a sort of a frontal clash. So let's also look at uh, US behavior in this, in this most competitive phase of the last five years, where we've seen China reorientation and the United States pivot, so it's an action reaction. It's remarkable that we haven't actually had a crisis between the United States and China. What's the closest thing we come to that underwater drone that was picked up a short while ago and returned within 24 hours? So the United States policymakers pride themselves on rapid risk management. Same with the Chinese. So I heard this comment by uh, in a Washington think tank I was uh, following a, uh, a recent discussion where they said, uh, despite the strategic distrust of the last five years, the relationship has somehow maintained and sustained itself. So, so there's obviously a lot of strands, apart from economic interdependence, which I'm not even including right now. I see cultural, triangular, geopolitical strands that are very powerful. So the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because the, the narrative today is that we are poised as a swing power. But for the United States, China has the swing power. They have a swing power between a US liberal order prolonging beyond its own primacy. And they're betting that China will be an uncertain partner, a competitive partner, but it's certainly going to be a joint pillar and a stakeholder in that system. And which it is doing, ironically. So the other irony you see from the United States uh, thinkers, strategists, is that China has become what they wanted it to be for the last 20 years, and now it's becoming a problem. But the problem is really about control and power over the governance and the rules, rather than a contest over the rules itself. The economic system broadly resembles what both would like, globally. Yes, you have a Washington consensus, you have extreme market new liberal worldview, which Chinese of course don't endorse, but neither does India or for that matter most of the developing world. So the the common strands of what we define as world order today, a UN centered system of great powers, the Chinese are quite satisfied with that. We are the ones who are the ones satisfied. Uh, so I I, I, I I think I'll just close by just making I, I think the odds of the United States making a strategic adjustment to China's rise are far, far higher than any sort of demise into its city traps or any kind of rivalry that you've seen in all the cases of previous startups. Thank you, Zurabar. That's an interesting uh, take. Because as much as you know, we keep talking about disputes in the South China Sea and, and the flare-ups, and he's, he's actually right. I mean, things haven't gotten out of hand in a way that the rest of the world has to be concerned. But having said that, uh, the rose, you know, last, uh, I think it was November of 2016, when uh, just before the Paris Climate Accord got signed, there was this, at that time, it was declared as a historic agreement between the US and China. Uh, the rest of the developing world had some reservations about it. But in any case, because of Mr. Trump and what he's done over the last few uh, months, basically pulling out of the Paris Accord, how, how does the developing world on the issue of climate change as well as energy security, how, how, do, how does the developing world ensure its own strategic interests uh, at a time when you're seeing phases of cooperation between US and China, and yet now you have a completely disruptive uh, US president? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just Thank you, uh, Zaka. This is a, a fascinating conversation. I'm very happy to be part of it. Um, so I think uh, my uh, sort of role in this conversation is to think about the China-U.S. story and its implications for the developing world for India through the lens of energy and climate change. Um, and not just Paris, but perhaps everything that Paris uh, represents. Uh, and I want to sort of pull back the lens a little bit and try and paint a picture of what's at stake here. Um, now, energy has always been a very important part of a strategic conversation, right, for obvious reasons. You can't run your military without it, you can't run your industry without it, 
you can't keep your population happy without <coughs> adequate and uh, reasonably cost, uh, cost effective energy. Uh, but I think where we're going is in terms of a strategic conversation moves well, well beyond that sort of conventional understanding of energy as a strategic issue. I think we're in a moment of ferment around energy, in part driven by climate change, but not entirely, that is more significant than we have seen for at least, for probably close to a century. Right? What are we seeing in the world of energy? Um, we are seeing uh, new sources of fossil fuel energy developed by the US, big head start for them, I'm talking about now what is called uh, shale gas, uh, tight oil, and so on, and so forth, these new technologies. But very rapidly, that advantage has been overtaken by incredible trends in renewable energy. And now, among en in energy circles, the conversation is not if renewable energy will start dominating, but simply when and under what conditions. It's a transition that has accelerated at a pace nobody thought imaginable a few years ago. In India, uh, renewable energy was being auctioned at, and priced at 17 rupees a unit of electricity in 2012. The last auction was for 2 rupees and 44 pesa. Okay, that's just in about five years. And that compares to 3 rupees plus for coal. Uh, BP releases these annual statistics. It shows that coal uh, use has been on a declining trend. Oil use is flat. Gas is still up a little bit. But far outstripping in terms of relative change is, of course, renewable energy. Now, renewable energy, uh, the rise of renewable energy brings with it a few things. For one, it's a whole different set of technologies. Who's going to dominate this technology? It's not just the panels, it's not just the windmills, but it's also battery technology. Once you get battery technology set, it also unleashes all kinds of changes in how we organize society, potentially how we organize transport systems, how we organize urbanization, how we move energy from one place to another, all of these things change. And so the strategic imperatives themselves change. The way we think about energy as a strategic issue are no longer just sea lanes and imports and ensuring a uh, supply of fuels, um, but it also is about uh, keeping up with the dramatically changing technology. So I just want to put this out there because the question then arises, which of these two vying powers, to the extent they are in fact you know, directly vying, has seen this coming? Um, if, you, if you believe my version of the, uh, of the strategic uh, um, importance of energy. So what has the US done recently? Right? So I think in the previous administration, the big story, as I said, was the rise of shale oil, shale gas, the ability then to actually undercut the West Asian oil producers, potentially um, the ability to start actually becoming, becoming net exporters of energy, unshackling themselves from all kinds of strategic constraints. But what we've seen with this administration is a seemingly, um, uh, um, I use the word obdurate perhaps, I can't, I can't because I, I have a, a normative bias here, uh, but it is, what they've done is they've, they've, the, the Trump administration has put out an energy order that essentially says we are going to revitalize coal. Right? And the general feeling in the energy world is, you know, good luck to you. Um, because coal is, has all kinds of problems. This is not to say that coal is, is done and dusted. It's over with. But whether it is going to see a revival, the economic forces really seem to suggest that that's going to be very, very hard to pull off. Uh, and I want to stress this. I'm not saying that coal is done. Uh, uh, but the question is whether we really see a revival. And in the discussion, we can talk about the comments of our CEA, for example, on this point as well. I think it's a salient issue uh, for us. Um, they also rolled back the Clean Power Plan, which was the central plank of their climate, domestic climate policy, which essentially said we're going to transition our electricity system to a clean, first gas and ultimately renewable-based system as soon as we can. And then they have cut down funds for research and development, and the U.S. has been the leader, in particular, in battery technology. They have, they have this ARPA-E program, which is acknowledged to be sort of the most dynamic and vibrant energy research program anywhere. They've been world leaders in this. So they have essentially uh, seem like they are ceding space. They are essentially uh, giving up an enormous advantage that they have had uh, in these arenas. What has China done? Let me throw out a few, a few numbers, because China is always fun when it comes to numbers. Right? 
um, just the scale of it makes it, makes it a, an enjoyable exercise. Okay, so China has invested, in 2016, they invested 100 billion US dollars uh, in renewable energy. That was twice what the US invested. 32 billion of those were overseas. Um, between 2015 and 2021, they are projected to uh, essentially dominate 40% of the wind market and 35% of, of the solar market uh, um, uh, globally. Um, very importantly, around the same period, they are expected to dominate 55% of global battery manufacturing. And batteries are really the core of this renewable transition because the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. To smooth out that energy production, you need, you need batteries. Uh, and they have, following the Trump administration's statement of intent to withdraw from Paris, and I, I use those words carefully because in fact, what the Trump administration said is we intend to withdraw because of everybody, uh, uh, the rest of the world, being concerned about such an action. The Paris Agreement was written with a one-year notice period and a, 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 a one-year waiting period and a three-year notice period. So actually, the US can only withdraw from the Paris Agreement formally uh, almost exactly at the time of the next US elections uh, to guarantee that it will be a political issue uh, in the US. China has kind of very, very happily walked into this vacuum. Uh, they have been working with the French and others, joint communicators all over the place. Our government has actually also been quite, uh, uh, quite upfront about this making statements about our support for the Paris Agreement. Um, and it's really ironic, actually, if you think about this, because uh, China has increased its uh, greenhouse gas emissions at an incredible rate over the last decade or so, the last decade and a half. It now accounts for about 30% of annual emissions, whereas the US is at about uh, 18 or 20%. And that went from somewhere around 15 to 17% about a decade and a half ago. So it's just about doubled its emissions. It's actually built a carbon buffer. And from that position has said, well, you know, we're sort of done. We're happy to, to, to pull back. And so it's actually positioned itself in such a way that if this fossil, if the renewable energy technologies really take off, if that revolution happens, it is poised to be, to both use that, those technologies domestically and export and be the primary place to go to for, tech, for, for export uh, and, and uh, assistance and so on and so forth. If it doesn't happen that fast, they actually have an abundant cushion, right? And they can reduce their emissions from a very, very high base. They also have a very inefficient economy, so it's relatively low cost for them to reduce their emissions. And so they're sitting quite pretty uh, uh, in, this, in this context. And they're obviously hedging their bets in all sorts of ways. One of the things they're doing as part of the One Belt, One Road uh, sort of construct is also looking at networks of, of oil and gas pipelines in the region. So they really have covered a lot of bases. So where this leaves me is to say, well, you know, it seems so obvious the Chinese are thinking about this in a far more expansive and strategically sophisticated way than the Americans, at least this uh, collection of Americans. But you have to ask yourself, is there something that they know that we don't? You know, are we, are we missing something here in the story? And I've sort of scratched my head uh, on this. Uh, and I actually don't think there's anything we're particularly missing. I mean, it's not necessarily the case, as I said, that this transition is a fait accompli. But if you're looking at a 15 to 20 year strategic horizon, I think it's very hard to say that the direction of change is not uh, in, in, in towards a, a more renewable energy uh, future. Um, and so what we're left with then is, and this is now part of sort of a larger story of looking at the US and China, is that the pathologies of a very, very divided US society, which is putting an incredible strain on its institutions, which really have been a model for the rest of the world, I mean, the robustness of US institutions, those pathologies are now seeping over to the US international uh, uh, presence in the international arena in a way that it didn't really happen in past with past administrations. They managed to sort of insulate that. Um, and I think and I think it's actually that's what we're seeing. Because uh, the US is giving up so much space uh, that I think it's so far it's been sort of a free ride for China. And I think for India, therefore, we can talk about this more in the conversation. India has so far had a lot of bilateral engagements with, with the US. But we've also had a strong relationship with China when it comes to climate change. Right? And so climate change, the climate change debate, I would suggest, needs to be thought of and subsumed 
within this larger story of an energy transition. Uh, and the Paris Agreement is sort of a way in which to make that transition happen. And we can talk more about it in the conversation, but I think the larger and more interesting question is really about the energy transition and how we interpret this, uh, this, uh, this seeding of space by the US and its enthusiastic grasping by China. Thank you very much, uh, Rose. I think that was very enlightening. I mean, the numbers that you put up about China, it's, it's staggering. With, with the Chinese, whether it's on manufacturing, whether it's on renewables, it's all about the scale. And it just makes you, you know, sit back and scratch your head. Why would the U.S. give up on something as important as renewable energy, uh, give up space to the Chinese? Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to touch upon, like Ambassador Menon said, that th there is a lot of strategic competition, but there are also a lot of areas of convergence between the U.S. and China. And certainly doesn't get talked about enough uh, in, in, in the media, and I'm not sure in academic circles either whether there's enough written about it. And much of it is driven to a great extent by domestic compulsions. Um, and I think Professor al would focus a lot on that, on, on the areas of cooperation, particularly, let's say, for example, on education. There are today more Chinese students uh, studying in the US and in US universities than, than of any other country. Right? And, that, and that's a big, big uh, uh, constituency, if I can use that phrase. So how is it that domestic factors are shaping the US-China narrative? Okay, uh, thanks, Zaka. And uh, uh, now uh, that I have actually got back into the teaching mode, uh, seven minutes is going to be a bit of a challenge. But I should try and uh, wrap up my main arguments here. Uh, I think uh, what we are looking at is really a framework, the dominant framework that, that uh, characterizes uh, this course debates on US-China relations, uh, which is that of the Thucydides trap. And uh, I think uh, this brings the focus uh, rather more than necessary on the political, uh, that's debatable, but it brings the focus more on the political causes <laughs> Um, the strategic issues, security, um, perceptions of uh, security, technical aspects, and so on. But what is largely overlooked here uh, is that uh, Thucydides himself emphasized the cultural characteristics uh, that gave rise to the sense that this was, uh, this was a trap in the making, and the importance of understanding the psychocultural basis of one's adversary. Uh, in fact, in 1990, it was Joseph Nye who had first spoken about the possibility of China and the United States walking into this trap, as it were. But he went on to uh, modify his, uh, his, his views a bit. Uh, and in 2015, he was asked in an interview whether this much anticipated clash, which, as I said, dominates uh, the discourse, uh, was actually based in reality or was it more of a or did it have more of a cultural basis? And uh, he did not in that interview precisely come down on whether it was cultural, but he said that this is not grounded in hard empirical analysis. And uh, he said it's largely a belief in the inevitability of the clash uh, that can actually become its main cause. I mean, he goes on to talk about how the US and China are very deeply entangled, that's a good thing. Uh, and that uh, what we are looking at is the beginning of a symmetrical interdependence uh, in the US-China relations, um, where there is not much power. Now, what I am bringing the argument around to is the importance of these perceptions, uh, mutual perceptions, that actually give rise to certain constructs, which go to shape uh, assessments and uh, and, and ideas about inevitability or, or not of, of inevitable clashes. Uh, I was reminded uh, of this uh, book by David Shambo in 1993, uh, beautiful imperialist, uh, where he, uh, which he, he he does an analysis of Chinese perceptions of of American, and a great deal of his basic contentions are still valid today. And I just take off from there because he sought to analyze perceptions in China about the U.S. Uh, from uh, Nixon's visit onwards. And uh, his study is rooted in the critical importance of perceptions uh, in the policy making. And he sort of draws this line between cognition and behavior and how perceptions work. 
Zora will just talk about that what they thought about has actually come to pass, so how perceptions actually <coughs> become reality. Uh, so he concluded that there were large gaps, uh, perception gaps on both sides, uh, which were interspersed with wishful thinking, misinformation, and cognitive uh, dissonance. And he linked this to language barriers, the Cold War, repeated conflicts starting right from the Korean War onwards, uh, and of course the consequent propaganda on both sides which shaped uh, the ideas. Jonavar uh, touched on this long history of relationship between China and the US. And, and in fact, uh, Shambo points to a love-hate diet uh, in this relationship, recurring uh, cycles of amity and enmity, cycles of contention and collusion. Uh, but since the 1980s, we are beginning to see a, a, a huge interest, increase in uh, a thirst for knowing more about the United States and China. Uh, and of course, uh, it has matched on the American side as well. Thousands, literally tens of thousands of books American, um, by American authors have been translated into Chinese. Um, in fact, throughout the 80s and 90s, the voice of America was heard by millions. So there were a lot of images that were being shaped through this uh, desire to understand uh, each other. The point is that as we move towards the end of the 20th century and we move into the 21st century, this dominant prism that existed on both sides, um, the image of America as the imperialist uh, and the image in America of China as the communist, this dominant image uh, starts to undergo a uh, shift. And uh, in fact, as we start to get into the discourse of China rise, uh, this lens actually starts to crack. I mean, that's the rather paradoxical, if you will, but it, it cracks and breaks into different, into many pieces. Um, there are still some big pieces. You still have the ideology, which is shaping a lot of the perspectives. You still have um, strategic distrust uh, and some other leftover historical complications. Uh, but it is the smaller shards through which people in the United States and China are looking at each other, which are, I think, far more interesting. So there is not a singular dominant lens. Um, and different sections of society on either side are perceiving each other. Uh, and we have been observing, of course, this starts with the 90s, 80s itself, but gathering momentum in the 21st century, and particularly over the last decade and a half, an expansion of Sino-US engagement, which involves investors, immigrants, students, entrepreneurs, and with them, newer ideas, which have begun to create an impact on the ordinary people in both countries. Uh, now, these, this influence, uh, it, it stretches outwards from the small towns, college campuses, businesses across both countries, the corporate sectors, and it is involving increasing quantities of capital, companies moving to and fro. Sectors are education, the entertainment industry, technology, and real estate. Now I'm quickly going to go through these one by one just to uh, show how uh, the, the dominant dynamics in the uh, primary US relations is actually splitting up into coalescing interests, uh, which are inevitably going to at some point start to influence policy, which they have already, I, I would argue, they've already done. Uh, we will pass quickly over the fact that China is now a household name in the United States. Um, its exports of goods and through what not cheap consumer goods uh, to every household in the United States, that's one. But it's really the education sector and students, uh, which is one of the most fascinating aspects of Sino-US engagement today. Uh, as one study said, that no group is more poised to alter the trajectory of Sino-US relations um, than the students and the, the uh, scholars that are now going to and fro. Uh, one million foreign students in China and one third in, in the United States and one third are from China. And this rise of the numbers of Chinese students has been the fastest among all the foreign students in China. Institutional variations ranging from 2% in some institutions and colleges to 11% uh, 
uh, in some colleges. And, and the instance, uh, the example I have in mind is the University of uh, Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign, where nearly 11% of the students are from China. Uh, and that has, in, in the, that has made interesting kind of uh, responses. Uh, the university actually broadcasts uh, football matches in Chinese uh, so that the students are able to follow the game. Uh, they have Chinese knowing counselors. Uh, in another uh, college in Iowa, where incidentally the number of Chinese students have added 100 billion to the economy of that small town, um, there the teachers are given instructions as to how to pronounce um, the, the names of the Chinese students correctly. So the point being that, and mind you, these are students who are full tuition paying students. Um, so obviously the role of the state here is, is quite clear. Uh, and both the governments are now actively pushing this in 2000 and, uh, uh, in 2006. Uh, they started something called a 100,000 strong initiative. That they would have 100,000 students exchange between each other by 2015. Um, so uh, you have therefore, oh, I'm running out of time now. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this, but the fact is that uh, we have now a new trend, which is that not just uh, higher education, but uh, we have uh, undergrad students, which are now the fastest rising sector in China. And now I read that uh, the, uh, the rich, the new rich in China are actually sending uh, students uh, to school. Uh, and a large number of uh, uh, Chinese students are actually going to school. This is the way in which they uh, hope to uh, increase the competitiveness. Uh, but but that's, that's, that's one part of the story. And then you have investment. Um, now, I need just one minute sure. more. I think uh, this, this is another interesting uh, dimension. Um, people often ask the question, is China buying up the US? Um, in 2016, they uh, invested almost 18 billion in the United States, which was a threefold increase uh, in 20, uh, over the, the previous year. And 84% uh, of this investment is going into the acquisition of US companies. Uh, we all know the more controversial uh, buyings, but uh, uh, there are less controversial uh, purchases. And that is changing the uh, landscape of the joint uh, US-China cooperation across a range uh, of uh, uh, new emerging industries. And the more interesting part is uh, the uh, sectors of uh, information technology, engineering, uh, and computers, uh, where you find a lot of tie-ups, uh, a lot of uh, R&D sectors are being set up in China by the Western multinationals. The Chinese are with uh, a lot of these multinationals to set up their R&D centers in, uh, in, in the United States and Europe. Uh, you have uh, technicians, uh, management professionals, um, uh, highly skilled labor going back and forth. And so there is a really a very, very dynamic exchange happening as a consequence of this increasing uh, Chinese investment. Of course, the caveat here is that we need to see that there are local backlashes happening and other kinds of frictions also take place. Um, but the Chinese are taking full advantage of a program called the EB-5 program where the Americans offer green cards to any investor who can give uh, who can create 10 jobs in the United States. Uh, and uh, there is a very, very uh, publicized story about how they, they, they contributed more than 80% uh, to a project in San Francisco, uh, which involved creating one of the biggest uh, retail uh, and uh, housing complexes in over a decade in the United States. And this is a largely one of the most poor uh, regions uh, in the area. Uh, they're providing jobs, they're providing houses, they put all the rest of it. Okay. Uh, finally, um, I will quickly get to uh, two more sectors which are showing the intense engagement happening at the people to people level. One is, of course, uh, tourism. Um, the Chinese are the biggest spenders in the United States, uh, and uh, the number of uh, is, uh, tourists uh, is increasing year on year. Um, finally, I'd just like to put this emerging picture in contrast to some research, this few research surveys which, which try to gauge public opinion. And we are seeing an interesting kind of a, a contradiction that is at play. And we need to watch how this happens. 
On the one side, you have this immense amount of engagement happening at the level of ordinary people, the middle classes, um, the upwardly aspirant mobile uh, generation. And this survey, which was done in uh, February of this year, I'm told there was another one in June, uh, where slightly different kind of uh, results came out. But the, the two trends which I found very significant in this survey of early 2016, uh, one was that uh, among the older generation, uh, 50 plus, uh, the negative views have increased. Overall, there has been an increase of negative perceptions uh, of China in the United States. But between the 18 to 35 year olds, there has been an actual decline in negative perceptions. Uh, similarly, in China, the ones which have a negative perception uh, is far less than the ones that we have in the United States, and the ones which have a positive uh, are more than. So clearly, within China, you are seeing a very interesting trend develop. Uh, there is a fascination with, uh, with the Americans, which we know about. Uh, we, uh, probably are all aware that Ivanka Trump has become some kind of a celebrity among the young people in China who are looking at, at, at uh, her entrepreneurship with uh, great admiration. So there is, the love-hate diet continues. And I think we need to understand that this will always be a function when two economies, uh, biggest economies of the world are engaging uh, in ways in which, uh, which were not thought of uh, in, in barely 10 years ago. The largest number of problems are happening with regard to the economic sector. So there are all disputes about how um, the laws are being used or Chinese are flouting the copyright and um, so on and so forth. Uh, but that, I would say, is, is an inevitable consequence of greater engagement. Um, the important thing is that, um, as Clinton said, that when we are looking at the United States and China, it's the economy stupid. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, to professor as well as all our panelists, I think we've touched a whole broad range of issues uh, from strategic to domestic, and of course climate change, energy security. What we'll do is, I think we've got about 35 minutes for uh, audience questions, so we'll go directly to the audience questions. My request is uh, keep your questions short, please identify yourself first. Uh, if you have a specific question for one of the panelists, then identify who your question is directed at, and uh, kindly keep it short Please refrain from editorializing. Uh, so let me start with the uh, prediction. If somebody can pass on a mic to it, please. Okay, I'm Jeru Chopra. I'm a combat veteran of four wars in think tanks globally. Very quickly, the key take I take from the lead speaker is manage. Now, what I want to know is 2049 is the deadline to Xi Jinping. Are we going to manage relations between the U.S. and China all the way to 2049? Because he wants to be the leader and to answer your negativity in China, they're less negative because everyone is convinced they will be leaders in 2049. Right. So I request your wise comments. And I'm very quick on energy. We're all talking of concerns of China on energy, sea lanes, water, etc., etc. But when I hear your astounding figures, why should China be so worried? And here we are talking about our Navy expanding, West expanding. Do they have a concern for energy? All we right. don't. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman in the green coat. Yeah, it's just okay. I'm Shantri Sir. I'm a journalist. This question is to Ambassador Shankar Manu. In the last I mean, at all times, one finds that uh, you spoke about India having all countries, like all countries, India having to negotiate between China and the US. There's always a contradiction, as I have noticed, between what the US expects, nudges, or encourages other countries to do and cheers them on to come from China. But the US itself doesn't come from China as much as it makes other countries believe that it is doing. I mean, there is a lot of empirical evidence, which I don't think I need to go, whether it's a shangri dialogue, one can see. For example, the US military commander talks about the South China Sea in very strident tones. But the defense secretary, when he speaks, I noticed the last shangri dialogue, at least eight times he mentioned about the importance of China-US economic relationship. 
and it dawned, well, this is reported and purveyed very widely. Right. Two days later, there is a strategic and economic dialogue, which one find, doesn't find any place at all. So I just want, would like to see how you negotiate this, how countries okay. negotiate this. Thank, Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Okay. So we'll bunch up three questions each. Uh, Suren Kumar, former Indian ambassador. I'm not an expert on China, I'm layman. What I've heard you all say is interdependence between US and China and also competition. Now, what are the prospects of the emergence of G2? Because both countries are aware of each other's strength and weaknesses and there's independence. But I think we have President the US with a deal maker, billionaire president who has been making a deal all the time. You raise the stakes, no one China, okay, they China. Currency manipulator, okay, you leave it. The North Korea not doing. And he is the right person to make deal with China. Let us settle, two of us can settle policy for the rest of the world. Thank you. Okay. All right, so you, you want to start off by. Since I'm the chosen one, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think they're all really the same question in different forms. You asked 2049, what is China aiming at? You know, it's interesting. Until, well, from sunny lands for about a year and a half from 2013 onwards, you heard the Chinese talking about a new type of mega power relations between China and the US, which sounded like G2, frankly, and sounded like, okay, we'll, we'll, between the two of us, we'll deal with the rest of the world. You saw signs of it before Paris, for instance, where it was ultimately what China and the US decided, which ultimately went through Paris, and the rest of us signed on to it in one form or another. Uh, but you don't hear that anymore. And not for the last year and a half have you actually heard the Chinese talking about new type of major power relations. And I think what you're seeing instead is behavior which suggests a much clearer, sharper Chinese drive to primacy. And I think this is natural. They've seen the balance of power shift. They're very sensitive to that balance. They're very quick to sense it. And they respond to it. Their behavior changes accordingly. And in frankly, it has always been a clear goal of China to achieve primacy in the system. They think that's how it has been in history, and that's how it should be. So they think it's returning to a norm. And so if that's the goal, the question then is, is the US prepared to accept that? Is the US prepared to accommodate not China as an equal or as a participant in a US-led order, but chi a Chinese dominated and run order with Chinese primacy. I'm not so sure that this is, you know, something that, and frankly, today you can't predict US re reactions. I mean, you look at President Trump, he came to power with a certain attitude to Russia and a set of things he said he'd do with Russia. None of that has happened. If anything, the opposite has happened. 98 to 2, the Senate votes and, in, and imposes sanctions on Russia. So I find it very hard to predict or to see the US establishment accepting the idea. They've been willing consistently to accept China as a partner, junior partner, in a US-led order. And that's what they were talking about since Dallas, Eisenhower, whatever, and certainly in the 60s and so on. But that's not what China sees as her role in the world. And I don't think that's how China is behaving today in the world. So if that's the case, then what you describe as US behavior is actually a sensible US behavior in tactical terms. If for any external power, it's best to be the balancer. So if, you know, between India and China, between Japan and China, for the external power, the easiest role is balancer. Let them do the hard work. You get the benefits. But, and that's what, when you say that the US doesn't actually stand up. For instance, I mean, many people will say that over the last five years, China has converted the South China Sea into the South China Lake. And that running US ships through it really doesn't change that fact. And today, ASEAN has actually accepted that in practice. So, yes. In instances where the US doesn't see a direct interest of her, her own, except keeping freedom of navigation going, she might accept a level of Chinese privacy. But whether systemically, 2049, uh, the Chinese goals, whether these are likely to be accepted, I find it very hard to believe. But, you know, that's, that's a matter of opinion now. 
And, and if you say that Trump represents an isolationist trend, which is very deep in the US, the US can withdraw behind these two huge moats that she has and step aside from the world and leave, leave it to China to run the world. You know, if you see that kind of world is likely, then yes, you can see a peaceful transition to the world. But I'm not sure that that's good. Okay, uh, let, let's get that side. Uh, okay, sure. The, the gentleman in the Hi, I'm Tilak. I'm currently working with the BBC. Uh, my question is that if you take the case, if you take the case of media relations between US and China, then the interesting thing that's happening in the recent times is the US president is calling that American media is fake, and Chinese media, of course, the state has a constant control of that. So my question is, is how do you see the US Chinese Chinese media shaping the relations over the country? Right. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I will refrain from answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> My question is to Ambassador uh, Kishmenen. Uh, since we have been talking about uh, the U.S. China relations and the impact, uh, now what do you think, and elaborate, can you elaborate on the impact of this relationship on India? Would it be adverse or in favor of India? Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador <coughs> Mazen. Sir, if you get China US ratio of the closer to it, is it just going to back to bi bipolar world? The way earlier we had a US Russia bipolar, that was much more stable. Uh, after that, it was or a unipolar or multipolar, that was much more stable. So, do you think this is the choice of uh, USA to make this type of situation? Because now China is a very rude, rogue country because of China. See, uh, only cares for any international court. So what's going to have impact on if something happened like North Korea or Pakistan? They have. Seen. All right. So I think we take one more question from uh, gentleman Green. Uh, thank you. My name is Yogen Kumar, former ambassador. I have a general question related to the panel, but uh, perhaps to ambassador. Nen. <laughs> okay. Uh, as I see, uh, if you see Trump's behavior vis-à-vis -vis Russia, for example, and and you have the case of uh, the, the, the uh, Korean uh, Peninsula crisis. Uh, what seems to be happening is that the attempt actually is to have a transactional arrangement, for example, even the latest one, where the exercise being actually being done more in terms of simulation rather than the earlier, the summer exercises which actually led to the Chinese Air Force being a high alert. So my question actually is that factors like North Korea, which are actually pricing apart these relationships, whether it is US, uh, and Japan, US and South Korea, uh, uh, Japan, China, US, China, Russia, and so on and so forth. So when this kind of thing is happening, uh, presently the, th the challenge really would be, and, and of course in the case of North Korea is that they can throw the missiles at US, nuclear missiles. The thing is that by this process, the possibility of the US alliance system, which is underpinning the security setup, let's say, in this part of the world, that may get undermined. So that may be a clutch point. And I'm just wondering, I mean, seeing the behavior of the US as an establishment and of course the leader in, in the, as the president, I'm just wondering how that will play out. Thank All right, thank you. I'll answer the media question at the end. <laughs> uh, to start at the end, I think it's clear that the old hub and spokes, which is what the US security system, RAM security system in the Asia Pacific was, you know, where they had individual relation, security relationships and commitments with Japan, with Korea, with that hub and spoke system can no longer work. It's no longer delivering security in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea. In fact, I think a lot of what China has done in the last, since 2008, pushing in the South China Sea, was to show that reliance on the US is not an answer. But this has, but China pushed in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. It has different effects. If you look at South, Southeast Asia, ASEAN hasn't managed to a common statement on the South China Sea for five years now. And in fact, you are seeing more and more ASEAN countries actually going along with what China is doing. Japan's reaction was the opposite, was to double down on the relationship with the US to strengthen the mutual security treaty and to amend her own constitutions. 
to permit the use of force in new situations. Now that's the now I can't believe that that was the goal of Chinese policy in the Senkakus or the Ayu, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so there is a problem today where as a result of the rise of China and what China has done, the old security structures no longer provide security. You don't have a new structure in its place yet. There is nothing else to replace it. It's not as though China has suggested a new security architecture for the region, or anybody else for that matter. Uh, and that's a, not a very satisfactory situation. Because when you come to an issue like uh, North Korea nuclear, again, the old six-party talks framework, which is what everybody has used to try and deal with it, that's not solving the problem. And you are now left with very few realistic prospects of denuclearization, which is supposedly everybody's goal. But I don't think anybody thinks it's likely, especially after Kim Jong-un has seen what happened to Gaddafi and what happened in in Iraq, I mean, he's not going to give up his weapons. So do you do a freeze, like you did with Iran? But you know, North Korea is, is way beyond that. Six nuclear tests, weapons, missile tests, and she has, she's actually a nuclear weapon state in being. Uh, and if you freeze her as a nuclear weapon state in being, can you prevent then South Korea, Japan from going nuclear in the next five years? I, I find that incredible, that they would accept that status, or that they would accept that kind of situation. So today you have an absence of a security architecture. The old architecture no longer works. You have issues which cannot be addressed by the existing system. And frankly, the US and China together, to go back to the G2, cannot solve it either. So it's not as though a G2 has an answer to these kinds of security problems. Uh, so this is why it's really worrying. Impact on India, you know, I, I, good or bad, this is a fact. Deal with it. I mean, for me, that's the only, you know, way to look at these situations. I mean, you're not making North Korea nuclear, you're not the creator of these problems. But these problems exist, and the powers behave the way they do for their own reasons, for their own selfish reasons. You need to do the same. Look at the situation, analyze it, see what works for you, what you can get out of it, what you need to defend against, and do that. So I'm very nervous about saying this is good for India, this is bad for India. Every situation, there's an opportunity. Thanks to the rise of China, you have wonderful friends throughout the region. Uh, you know, so, I think you, it's not a question of is it good or bad, I think you need to look at it objectively. How it's evolving and what, what you can make of it for the transformation of India, which for me is, is primary. That's your job, changing India. That's the biggest, anyway. Thank you. Alright, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll just quickly answer the media question. Uh, there, there was a time, I think in 2008-9, after the success of uh, Al Jazeera, uh, there was a realization among the Chinese, particularly after the uh, Beijing Olympics, that this is a possible model uh, where they can have state media because they have almost infinite resources uh, and they can then push uh, those state enterprises in the media, whether it's CCTV, whether it's China Daily, or CRI to open up. So I think in 08, 09, that process began, I think, between these four big uh, state-owned media enterprises, they pumped in something like eight or nine billion dollars, uh, and they opened up, like CCTV example, I mean, because I worked there, they opened up bureaus all over the world, every capital almost had a, had a bureau, they had broadcast centers in Nairobi, in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so there was, a, there was a real opening up of, uh, of, the, of the media space in China catered to the, to, to the international market because they wanted to put the Chinese point of view out there for the world uh, to see and hear. What has happened as a post that, let's say from 2012 onwards, with Xi Jinping coming in and that sort of collided with the increasing uh, disputes in the South China Sea, uh, the flare-ups and so on, is that increasingly the media also got tighter. 
for example, you know, going back to the uh, Yu and Senkaku example, uh, till, about, till about September of 2012, every copy that CCP English is put out on air had the, the fact that these are disputed islands, uh, China calls them Yu and uh, the, the Japanese call them Senkakus. One fine morning in October of 2012, that line just went missing. Right? So, so I'm just giving that as an example because that's essentially what has happened from, say, late 2012 onwards. There's been a tightening of, uh, of even their international media. As a result of which, you know, today, honestly, the way the, you know, the way global opinion looks at, say, Russia today or a, or a, or a CCTV, I don't think is terribly different. Today is unwatchable sometimes, but but honestly, I don't see them uh, being viewed say in the same way as you'd view an Al Jazeera. So I think there has been a bit of a clampdown in, in the last three four years or so, as a result of which a lot of the the foreign staff employed by these media organizations are leaving. You know, a lot of Americans have gone back. Uh, they they hired a lot of uh, Brits. They've all they've all sort of out of the process of leaving or, or or have already left. So there's been a bit of a Backlash to that as well. All right, well, let's get more questions. Yes, so the gentleman the picture. Somebody can give a more questions. I'm the Lani. If you look at the map of Asia, India right in the middle, and then you mark out or draw out one belt, one road, CPC, rather. <coughs> Sri Lankan port that's coming up by the Chinese assistance, South China Sea, what China is doing, not doing in North Korea, and Dokla. It might appear that these issues and points are disparate, unconnected, no relationship. But actually, if you really see deeply, China is displaying under the mask of trade and investment, international trade and investment, its geopolitical, geostrategic vision and strength. My question is, do we, does India have the strategic mind, the strategic vision, the strategic framework, really a backbone to measure up to China? All right, thank you. Uh, somebody can pass on the mic. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a reference was made to Apple and to Guzmán. Uh, the fact that they, they make substantial profits out of China. Uh, one of the elements of Trump's rise has been uh, the people in the Midwest who are worried about employment. So, uh, and it's easy to, to impose sanctions on Russia because there are no Apples and DuPonts there. Although they could be, depending upon how companies in the U.S. decide in the future to, to spread. But obviously, cost of labor in Russia is going to be high compared to China. Now, given this situation where the rise of Trump, irrespective of how uh, sort of uh, maverick he is in terms of his policies going forward, one thing he'd probably like is to be re-elected. If he wants to be re-elected, then he needs to <clears throat> address the concerns of his core constituencies, one of which is this group of people who feel challenged in terms of their future employment. Now, if you look at the bilateral trade, it's about 350 billion in favor of China in 2017, 16-17, which is about 2% of, of US GDP. So without getting into Joe Stiglitz and globalization and its discontents, because Professor Bhagwati, not me, uh, rather Professor Bhagwati has written about uh, the, the, uh, the reason why globalization actually works. So when you look at these two countries, Russia and China, it becomes very apparent that it is more difficult for the US, for the deep state in the US, and I'm not here referring to the military industrial complex, I'm referring to the Boeings and Wall Street and so on. How will Trump negotiate this? Assuming he really wants to to get re-elected. Right. I think that's a reasonable guess. Okay. Uh, we'll take one more question. Thank you, Kung Kaponti. My question is for Dorawar. When you mentioned the mutual accommodation desire in the US and China, 
What do you make of the American uh, policies so far to essentially penalize any company or country which does not uh, in some way follow its own unilateral uh, sanctions uh, on other countries? As you know, Europe has, risked, has paid over the last few years several billion dollars in penalties to the US, uh, US Justice Department simply for uh, losing, doing business with countries that the US did not approve of. So how would they accommodate China on that? Because China very clearly will never agree to pay this kind of penalties. And briefly regarding Professor Dubash's contention about what is really happening with the energy scene, are you aware that there is a rumor that by 2020, the US is expecting disruptive energy technologies to be available on the market and to considerably limit the scope of renewables? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll start with Robert and uh, Moses' questions. So in July, uh, they had this uh, comprehensive economic dialogue of the Chinese and the Americans. And it's fascinating when you see the the statements from either side, the American side sort of shows this deadlock or sort of no outcome. And the Chinese side sort of gives a far more growing positive, forward looking, specific. It's almost like they are wanting to engage the Americans on these things, whether the bilateral investment treaty, others. And I want to just weave it into that comment where you made that. Uh, I, I see that I'm, my assumption is that the Trump regime has been severely pulled back and contained by the old order, which is for globalization, for engagement, for interdependence, and MNCs to continue their uh, operations. So now the challenge is going to be how it's going to be cooperation by stealth with China. You can't show outcomes. <laughs> and because it's, I urge you to see those joint state uh, separate pieces of that. And, but on the other hand, if the domestic lobby or for reindustrialization, economic nationalism, the so-called Bannon view, even though he's sort of been <coughs> severely weakened, then you could see the United States and China actually, or the United States side, seeking relative gains from this vast, dense interdependence. And you might see economic conflict, tension, friction. So the, the one issue area which actually keeps them together might just become the sole uh, <coughs> sort of uh, arena for conflict. But I don't think we are heading there. I think the globalizers still hold the upper hand. <clears throat> Thank you. Before I get to the question about uh, disruptive technology and so on, I could just pick up a piece of the question about whether India is, is um, uh, really? adequately prepared uh, strategically in, in, in the area that I know a little bit better. Um, you know, I, I confess to a certain degree of, of, of frustration, and that's why I chose to sort of pick up on this question, because I feel that given the kinds of changes that we see happening, uh, there is an, we, we move from uh, a stance of great reaction to what was happening to a fairly um, uh, shallowly rooted uh, uh, target setting kind of mentality without actually backfilling what it would take uh, to achieve targets and to join the dots between changes in one sector and transformations that we're currently undergoing. So for example, to also draw a strand back to, to this conversation here about, about uh, concern over jobs uh, in the Trump administration, well clearly we have a great deal of concern over jobs growth uh, in India. We're entering in a, situ into a situation where the, the Chinese model of a manufacturing boom uh, is, is under uh, a lot of pressure. Whether that can be reproduced in India is, is really unclear. What does this energy transition that I that I talked about mean for India's intending jobs transition. What does it mean for our urbanization transition? Some of the uh, estimates suggest that two thirds of the building stock in India in 2030 are yet to be built. Right? We have a, actually an enormous opportunity to avoid locking into certain patterns of energy and think about how do we how do we make this transition happen in a way that achieves our other objectives, including jobs, including local environment protection, and so on. I just do not see the strategic thinking uh, at the scale necessary, both in terms of linkages within domestic policy making and then their implications for international and, and foreign policy uh, 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 at, the, at a level that, is, uh, that measures up to the challenge. So I just put that, put that out there. With regard to the specific question, you know, um, 
uh, maybe you're right, maybe in fact the US does know something the rest of us don't know and, and, and so on and so forth, but, uh, that, but it seems to me a little bit too easy an answer. Uh, but, uh, but the larger point I would make is, in a sense, we are entering a phase of disruption. So new technologies will come, there'll be new sort of some, some things that look promising and they fail, but I don't think we're gonna roll back the clock. Whatever changes happen are unlikely to resuscitate coal and to some extent oil. And even more important, it's less, it's almost less important what actually happens and more important what people think will happen. So you're already seeing anticipations of the demise of fossil fuel being priced into the asset values and the share prices of some of these fossil fuel companies. Banks are refusing to lend for new coal-fired power plants even in India, right? Given, it, and, and despite the fact that we still have 250 million people without power and we have, uh, 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 you know, 1,200 units of electricity per, uh, uh, on average per Indian versus 13,000 for an average American, so there's a lot of scope for growth. But the perception is that a moment has been reached and something dramatic is going to change in the energy sector. And I think that we, would, we will be ignoring that perception and the investment patterns and the expectations that follow those perceptions uh, at our own peril. Can I, can I add to the about will India measure up, can India measure up? If you go by empirically, by our record over the last 30 years, I think you need to take a slightly more nuanced view. Uh, by results, yes, we've measured up. Because by every metric of power, we have done better against every country in the world except China. If you look at the hard measures of of power, of comprehensive national power. But if you break it down, we've actually, on the diplomatics, external security side, I think we haven't done badly. Because we've managed to avoid entanglements, we've, we've managed to use the external environment for India's domestic transformation. We've grown it over 6% for, for 30 plus years, etc., etc. We have not adapted as quickly to internal security challenges, or to, and I think we adapted very rapidly to the economic crisis in 91 and so on, but thereafter it's been an incremental process. So have we shown the ability to respond to external changes, to stimuli? Yes. Uh, have we shown the ability to do the internal things that we need to, building structures, institutions, ways of thinking, the backfilling that you're talking about? Oh, more difficult to give you a, a clear answer. Uh, and that's really where, the, you know, the institutionalization of strategy, I mean, in, in a sense, is where we, we haven't actually done that yet. The whole idea of setting up an NSC and so on was actually exactly that. To start taking a holistic view across the board, to start developing. And we've tried, and we've actually had national security strategies and so on, drafts prepared. But uh, so far it hasn't got political approval or consensus yet within our structure. Now, that's both a strength and a weakness. Because you don't have these overarching sense of national strategies, you're free to react really opportunistically and to, to changes in the situation. You're not locked into an ideological view of what's happening and you don't, you're actually much more flexible. And frankly, at your level of power, that's very useful. It's necessary also, probably. But, so, so mine is a bit more complicated as an answer to your question than, than the other All right, I think we have Five more minutes, so that's the last set of three questions. Yeah, I have, uh, you know, all this, so far, the discourses that China seems to be invincible. My question is, does it have an Achilles heel, like Xinjiang province, like Tibet, like uh, different provinces, the resistance coming up, a lot of, uh, what should I say, resentment, within the societies in, in China and all that. So my question is, does it have an Achilles heel, or is it uh, something written on the wall? All right, um, let's do it. Uh, do not come back. We'll just give you a mic. Uh, 
My question is to Dr. Alka Arya. Uh, these tens of thousands of Chinese students now going to USA, are they returning to China? And on return, what sort of attitudes are they adopting? Thank you. One last question. Mr. Menon, you have become the main target of attack. <laughs> so I am also tempted to attack you. I have basically uh, two questions, very, very brief questions. One is India has a military alliance with the US now. India has given up a non-alignment. We have uh, three agreements we have. No, the point is that if there is a conflict over South China Sea, what, where would India come in? Number two, very, very brief question again. I read today that China has set up a diplomatic trap for India over Dokla. The issue is not Dokla at all. It is the issue is basically who will be more influential in uh, Bhutan. India is now a dominant influence in Bhutan, but China wants to displace India. How do you react to that? Do you want to start with the student? Uh, okay, so I think that's that's really the, uh, the interesting part of the whole student exchanges that are going on because, you know, they're potentially uh, transforming kind of. Uh, two things are happening. One, that uh, uh, if we compare the number of work permits that are being given to students from India and students from China, we find that there are larger work permits being given to Indians. Uh, so clearly, there are not uh, the numbers of Chinese applying for permission to work and so on are less, um, and despite the larger number of students, which means that much more are going back. Uh, the state has also instituted a very concrete policy to bring back uh, all the people uh, as much as they can uh, back uh, to the home country with offers of great jobs, they have institutionalized their entire um, higher education systems, research, uh, R&D, and so on. Uh, and these people are going back to, to man these institutions uh, with these backward linkages that they have built up. Uh, so clearly, those are going to play. In fact, both in the United States and Canada, we find that uh, uh, lesser Chinese are applying for work permits and uh, more Indians are applying. So that partly would address the problem of how the state is positioning itself also vis-a-vis -vis these large and manpower. Last word on both those questions. Well, um, is Dokram a diplomatic trap for us? You know, frankly, this is Bhutanese territory. It's for Bhutan to decide what. I don't see how it's a trap for us or not. We do what we have to, what we're obliged to. Uh, under our arrangements with Bhutan, and I think that's so. I don't, I don't see it so much as a as a trap, as a situation which now let's see how we we can work our way through this, and uh, and whether we have a role in South China Sea conflict. Our interest in the South China Sea is is simple: is freedom of navigation, because an ever increasing amount of our trade actually flows east. And in also in respect for the international order, I'm across in the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, because that for us is, is a basis of, is of the rule-based order that uh, that's it. We're not, we don't pronounce on what belongs to whom and where and, you know, that's not what. So I consider it very unlikely that those two principles would bring us into any actual military conflict in that region. Unless we expand our definition of our interests differently, or we are attacked, you know, some of our reads and so on, that's a different, but, but those are very unlikely possibilities. But to the big question about what is China's Achilles heel, you know, China, it's not a question of, nobody's invincible. Not China, not US, not anybody. China has a peculiar situation. She's in a very crowded neighborhood. Uh, geopolitically, if you look at it, at just her geography. She has land borders, she has strong powers immediately on her periphery. Quite unlike the US, who you know, sits behind the two largest oceans in the world and can intervene where she wants and go home when she doesn't want to. 
Uh, China doesn't have that luxury. She has countries which are rising, maybe not as fast as China in the last 30 years, but which are rising around her. And not all of them have easy relations with her over history. She still has boundary disputes, maritime disputes. She has a whole set of issues across these borders. She considers her own internal periphery, whether Tibet, Xinjiang, and so on, as fragile and acts very, and therefore acts almost neuralgic about anything happening in, in these areas. So I think you have to think of China as a slightly different power from the way we think of other powers. I'm not saying these are necessary Achilles heels, but what it does is it changes the way China looks at the world and the way China deals with the rest of the world, and the way she reacts to, to what happens with, with, and certainly for all of us. Her priority, I mean, is regime survival, and maintaining the nature of the state at home. That is her priority. Second, pacify the periphery. The rest of it, and the periphery is where her power actually applies. Whether you look at us, you look at the whole periphery, and that's exactly what we're seeing right now. The rest, running the world, she doesn't say, she doesn't say, here's my alternative world order. She just says China's the center of the world. And she will use situations to see how that helps her achieve her double hundred goals. She set goals for herself to be a prosperous country, advanced country by 2049. And that's what she wants to do. So, Rather than she has strengths, yes, she has weaknesses. One thing that worries me is, why is she in such a hurry? If the future is hers, why is so much pushing all around? Do they know something we don't know? Is this their moment of relative power at its height? Because if you think of their demography, for instance, by 2040, China will have the same demography as Japan has today. And Japan's the oldest or grayest of major economies today. There are other reasons to think of this. Other countries are, are changing. The base of the world economy could change thanks to energy, thanks to digital manufacturing. And there are things which you know, could eliminate China's advantages very quickly. When you take a strategic view and you look at uh, so maybe, maybe that's what drives China. So not so much Achilles' heel as I think understanding her peculiar situation. There's never been a power like this in history, and I don't think there ever will be. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think on that note, let's so, go to conclude this first ICS conversation. On my thanks to all our panelists, Professor Acharya, Ambassador Biden. Uh, Dr. Dabroz and Dr. Zarabar. Uh, thank you very much for this lovely audience. You've uh, been very patient, lots of incisive <laughs> questions, uh, and our thanks to ICS for putting together the first ICS conversations. Thank you very much.